What I'd like to do in my seven minutes is just highlight what I think are three very serious concerns about what's happened to global institutions since 2008. So let me just very briefly do that. So the first is about global regulation. And it's really, a, we've got various provocations in the work we're doing at Oxford on global regulation. But the point I wanted to make in this parliamentary building is that one of the lessons of 2008 is that regulators in a country in which the financial services sector plays such a massive role have very little backing and very asymmetric incentives to regulate their financial services sector robustly. Put simply, the golden goose is dazzling. It's dazzling to the regulators, it's dazzling to the politicians, it's dazzling to the financial services firms, and it's dazzling to citizens where easy credit is available. And what that means is that there's a very special instrumental role that global negotiations play in helping bolster the hand of regulators. It's once British regulators and American and Dutch regulators have to sit down with their counterparts from China, from Brazil, from differently regulated sectors, from countries who don't have the same concentration of internationally exposed finance and who therefore bring to the table their concerns that can actually strengthen the hand of regulators. Are we seeing this happen in the Basel process? I would say no, not nearly enough, not nearly as much as we need to see it happen. So we can, and I think there is, I, I guess, the, the conventional view is that we can afford to be a little bit complacent about the Basel process. There's been progress on capital standards, on liquidity standards, on leverage. I take a, a slightly different view of that. I think if you're going to be serious about capital standards and you're going to say banks should provide for themselves and not rely on an implicit public guarantee, then the benchmark should be what do private banks do, where the skin of the owners is always in the game. And private banks in the United States, private banks in Switzerland, private banks in Brazil hold much higher. They hold double the capital that the new Basel standard um, we're told presents as adequate. Likewise, we're not seeing swift enough resolution on cross-border issues. We're not seeing swift enough um, resolution on too big to fail. These are very difficult issues, but the point I want to, to leave with you is this point that the golden goose is very dazzling in these open financial service sector economies, and they need those regulators from much more closed and less financially reliant systems to keep them focused and to, and to redress the imbalance of incentives they face in regulation. My second point is about global firefighting. So it's particularly about what's happened to the IMF since 2008. Obviously, we saw a pinnacle, a great promise in 2009 of a doubled IMF with much greater participation of emerging economies. We saw the BRICS stepping up to the plate, showing willingness to lend to the, to the IMF in a short-term way. That has very rapidly fallen away. The IMF is now extending 89.7% of its GRA to Europe. That's a dramatic shift not just of the IMF's resources, but of all of its research attention, its policy attention, its expertise, and at the same time, the promised governance reform package that was promised in 2010 hasn't happened. It requires the US assent, which requires congressional assent, which means it will go through when the Congress passes its budget, people think, but of course, it looks unlikely that that budget's going to pass in any event. So, so the, the reform package isn't happening. And what that means is, I think, that we see an IMF that is overextended in Europe, that has an expertise being skewed towards that one region, and has a much diminished willingness from non-G7 countries to contribute, because they've done it once and were promised greater representation. They still haven't been given that greater representation. They're not going to put more money on the table a second time round for the same used car, as it were. So my second concern about the system is about 
the way in which we've seen the IMF move from that promise of reform into an IMF that doesn't look ready for a crisis that is likely to emerge outside of Europe and affect at least one or two other countries than the first country hit by a crisis. And then the IMF will not have adequate resources or expertise or willingness to call on short-term resources. That's a, that's a problem. And then my third point is about global safety nets. So it's about what's happened to the World Bank since the crisis. We saw a huge, re a huge increase in World Bank lending in the year after the crisis, which now <coughs> has been converted into two effects. One is the World Bank is, has sharply turned a corner and is rapidly trying to reduce its lending in every region of the world to, to lessen its exposure, conservative position take, taken by its creditors. But secondly, countries in regions are choosing to borrow from their regional development banks, not from the World Bank. So if you just chart graph by graph, region by region, you can see that the World Bank's non-concessional lending, that's how it earns its income, is dropping dramatically while its regional competitors, if you see them that way, are rising dramatically. What that means is the World Bank faces a very rapidly diminishing income stream. It's that, that's the first problem for the bank, a rapidly reducing income stream. The second problem is it still hasn't cracked lending fast. All the heroic efforts made after 2008 managed to reduce its, its fastest possible loan time down to somewhere between 15 and 18 months. That's a long time for a country to spend in an emergency room. Mm. And the bank's got to go a lot <laughs> faster and harder to reduce that further. But the most important point I want to leave you with about the World Bank is why we need it at all. If regional development banks, national development banks are stepping up to the plate, why do we need a World Bank? To me, there is one rationale for the World Bank, which is to serve as a global allocating mechanism counterbalancing the fashions and fads in development finance that lead to donor darlings who take everything, who are the fashion for bilateral aid agencies, for foundations, for gates, for everybody else, who all tend to lend to those donor darlings, leaving completely stranded the donor orphan countries, the countries who nobody's lending to and therefore nobody's lending to. There is a very clear global allocation role for the World Bank, and it is not one the World Bank has stepped up to. It found in 2008 that it couldn't step up to that because it was, it was tripping over its own rules. It was unable to make new loans in the wake of the crisis. All it could do was front load existing loans. That's a role for its members as well as the bank itself to unblock. So those are the three concerns I want to put forward to you, the dazzling golden geese, the slightly distracted fire service that we have in the IMF, and the safety system which is weakening day by day if you follow the balance sheet of the World Bank. I think we should all be concerned about those. Thanks. Mm -hmm.